Good folks, this is Steve Tatro. I'm the Vice President of Innovation and Growth, focusing on financial services and insurance for New Desic. What that basically means is I get the pleasure of meeting with all of our largest customers and solving all of their most interesting problems. I also have an innovation team that has 15 people on it, and we take all of the new cutting edge Azure technology, as well as the new desk solution accelerators, and we create industry solutions with them. I'm gonna walk you through a couple of those today. Hi everyone, my name is Charles Morris. I'm the Chief Data Services here and how Azure AI and OpenAI are being used by our financial services customers across a variety of use cases. And I wanna talk about some of the ways that this technology is actually being implemented and how we're seeing the opportunities for transformation uh, throughout the financial services industries. Transforming rapidly. What we're seeing is that we are at a new inflection point of technology. Recent breakthroughs in AI have enabled a whole suite of apps of experiences that previously were impossible. And now we're seeing that people are really capitalizing on this momentum. And this isn't just hypothetical. It's not that we're just at the early stage and this potentially is going to be impactful. It already is. Technology is here now and both Microsoft and our customers are bringing this uh, technology to bear in production scenarios throughout uh, our industries. Of course, Microsoft is always customer zero here. We, we really believe in using our own technology and we're making impact in our own business, but we try to make that technology available to our customers as well. And our customers are seeing great success. When you look at CarMax, for example, they're able to take what would have taken them 11 years and get it down in days. Progressive is saving tens of millions of dollars annually with AI powered chatbots. And EY is helping uh, prepare and staff their workforce so that they're able to get less manual work and elevate the quality of what their workers are able to accomplish. So we can let them do more of those actually challenging tasks for humans. I think what's being revealed here is that AI can help us do a lot more of these mundane tasks that what we used to think was hard, we're actually realizing is a lot simpler. And that's things like semantics and structure and early content first draft generation and allowing us to focus on what is actually more important and harder and for humans to do. And that's the idea of creativity and reasoning. These are the situations that we want to enable people to do more of and allow AI to be sort of a co-pilot that allows people to generate and understand content faster than ever. We have this opportunity to use AI to lead the transformation and actually drive new innovation and not just incrementally improve what we have, but actually reinvent how certain applications are done, how certain scenarios are delivered. And again, we're at the point where we're probably going to see entirely new experiences uh, becoming possible because we've made these significant breakthroughs in AI that are just opening this entire new suite of experiences. This means that in the age of AI, every app should be intelligent. We need to be re-examining our app portfolios and figuring out which of our applications do we want to move on into the next era? Which ones do we want to reimagine? And which ones do we want to augment? If we could take this view and we can really critically think and start with a zero-based approach and move forward with what we have that's good and redesign what works, we can build new experiences and be more efficient, increase the productivity of our teams, and move across and build better apps using data and using AI to generate new experiences for our customers. Of course, I know a lot why a lot of people are here. Right? They want to hear about open AI. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that partnership between OpenAI and Microsoft. Several years ago, OpenAI uh, started working with Microsoft because they were developing new cutting edge tech and they were starting to run up against the limits of what was possible with the technology at the time. So with OpenAI and Microsoft have partnered to develop new AI infrastructure, to develop new software and middleware optimization layers to build and deploy models at scale that previously were not possible. When we take this technology together, we have enterprise grade support to build these powerful AI models. It's one thing to build an AI model in a lab and release a research version. That's important work. And of course, Microsoft and OpenAI do that as well. But bringing it to scale across our enterprise customers, that's a whole separate challenge. Now, when we're talking about OpenAI and Microsoft, we're really trying to open up these generative AI foundation models. 
And as many of you are probably familiar, there's three categories of models that really fit within this OpenAI portfolio. There are the GPT-3 models, which are primarily large language models designed to do summarization and text generation. And you can use them for a wide range of language related tasks. This flexibility is really powerful because it's enabling scenarios that previously were not possible. For example, accurate summarization that specifically targets key pieces that you want to withdraw from your information or generating a first draft content so that you can get further with your day faster, generating more information off of your base knowledge systems and your, your own workers' expertise. We're also seeing these codex models, which are geared specifically towards code. Uh, now, of course, many of you are probably familiar with GitHub Copilot, and I'll dive into Copilot a little bit later. But at the core of this is we know that generating code is difficult and time consuming. So these AI models are acting as a co-pilot to help us generate code faster, help us build more faster, and help increase uh, coder productivity. And of course, another one that may be less relevant to financial services, but I'm you know, hoping to see some interesting applications as we go on is Dolly, where you can set, submit text and generate images on the fly. Right? These images that do not exist anywhere else, they're uh, generated just based off of what you write. These are really powerful technologies. Now, this partnership between Microsoft and OpenAI has led, of course, to the Azure OpenAI service, which our customers are incredibly excited about. I'm having many conversations every single week. Customers are trying to understand which use cases are good use cases for this. How can I make this viable in my own environment? Uh, and of course, what we're doing here is we're taking these large pre-trained foundation AI models from the OpenAI team, and we're baking them into Azure as an Azure enterprise service. And what this means is you get the same models that OpenAI is publishing, but you get them with that enterprise guarantee of governance, privacy, safety, all within the Azure ecosystem, in your Azure tenant, in your Azure subscription, managed by you. We're seeing a number of workloads being able to be opened up around this, especially around writing assistant and con uh, assistance and content creation. Uh, the ability to kind of reason over and summarize unstructured data and get answers to questions. Right. And of course, we're seeing a huge interest in improving the experiences of chatbots and virtual agents as well. Now, what makes these models different? With the Azure OpenAI service and the OpenAI models, these models are generative models, which means everything they do is based on this concept of prompts and responses. You give it a prompt, and it generates on the fly an answer based on the probabilities of the trained model. So that could be as simple as a zero shot prompt where you just ask it to do a task and see how well it does. In this case, write a tagline for an ice cream shop and it will just do that. But as you get more complex, you might want to come in and do few shot and zero shot training or, and multi shot training. From there, you know, you might move on to fine tuning to really uh, make it so that the model has accurate responses, uh, low latency and moving on from there. But honestly, propped engineering is probably the most important skill. And this is a skill that every organization is going to need to develop because defining the right prompts is really where you get the value out of these models. So I have an example here of a meta context, which is helping the model actually understand what you want it to do and how you want it to behave. By giving the model additional hints of what you want it to do, how you want it to act, which information it can use, how much it's allowed to extrapolate or improvise versus how much you want to restrict it to certain specific content. Uh, this helps the model get the responses you're after. So as you start to build out this prompt engineering skill set, you'll be able to do more and more use cases uh, more safely, and you'll be able to design safer mitigations to get the models to do what you want and enable use cases that seemed impossible just years ago. Now, what's really made this possible, and I mentioned this earlier, is that OpenAI is relying on Azure infrastructure. And as part of this partnership, we've just really advanced the state of the art. But the good news is that this Azure AI infrastructure is available to our customers. And we're building these models on this supercompute powered by NVIDIA chips running with InfiniBand connectivity in our networking uh, to do these projects with high throughput that previously wouldn't have been possible to deploy at this scale. Now, of course, we're wrapping this all into our broader Azure AI ecosystem so that for you, it's just another Azure service. So you have all these possibilities, all this functionality baked in, and it's managed the same way the rest of your Azure state is, is managed.
It's also useful to understand how um, OpenAI fits into our broader portfolio of AI services, because OpenAI is phenomenal at text generation, generation and summarization, and it can handle a wide range of other tasks. Uh, but it's not necessarily going to be the best uh, service for every single scenario. One simple example of this is if you're going to do translation, OpenAI can easily handle multi-language translation. However, it might be more cost effective to work with our XYZ code models that underlie the translation service, which will have higher ac accuracy uh, and probably be more cost effective in the process. By combining our services together, you're able to uh, generate really powerful ex uh, examples where you're using OpenAI plus another service. So we see this a lot with Form Recognizer, for example. Use Form Recognizer to extract the content from all these PDFs and documents. And then you can use OpenAI to do things like summarization or classifying the tables that are coming out of the document. And when we combine our services together in holistic solutions, we see that we open up a whole suite of solutions. And we do this ourselves. So we have a number of foundation models available for us. Now, for those of you who don't know, what is a foundation model? One way to think about it is that these models are becoming platforms. These foundation models are extremely large models that require deep expertise, massive amounts of data, and massive compute over sustained periods of time to build. So when you take these foundation models, having every customer go out and build a foundation model for every task they could possibly imagine is not practical. Practical. So instead, what we do is we take these foundation models and train them on a massive amount of data for different, ta uh, different scenarios. And then we can just fine tune them for the specific tasks we want to do. Now in the open AI world, the foundation models will be GPT, DALI, and Codex. Uh, and in the Microsoft, uh, Direct ecosystem, we have our Turing language understanding models, which still excel at things like classification, entity extraction, and are at the top of many of the industry leaderboards, as well as Z code in Florence. And when we combine these services together in our own products, we're enabling new experiences as well. So, for example, in Outlook, many of you have probably noticed that when you're type type typing away, it's predicting what you're going to do next. It's all running on Azure AI technology. So one of the cool things about Microsoft is we really do use our own services really well at scale. So when you're using Teams and you're doing live captions or live translations, or again, doing look ahead predictions in Office, uh, we're using the same services behind the scene that are available to you as a customer. We don't have any special sauce. We're just using our own services and we're making those available to you. So of course, if we do something in our product and you want to use that, you should be able to. But if you want to build something for yourself, you have access to all the same tools. I want to talk about some of the ways we're using OpenAI specifically in our products to inspire some of the ways that we're expecting customers to use it. In Teams Premium, for example, uh, we now do call, um, sorry, over there, cut. In Teams Premium, for example, we use AI-powered intelligent recap to automatically generate notes and to-do lists as well as create time stones in the video recordings. Doing live translation as well. This is all using OpenAI and our Azure AI technology at scale. In Viva Sales, we're using Azure OpenAI to help automatically generate emails uh, so that it can read the data from the CRM and generate a first draft so that the seller has the information ready to go. They can make any modifications that they want to before, they, before the email goes out, that human in a loop component but they're able to accelerate in things that would have taken them an extended period of time. The first draft is just there. If you can reduce that time consistently across the board for every employee, the potential that unlocks in terms of human pro productivity is absolutely massive. And we're expecting customers to keep creating similar experiences or better experiences or more tailored experiences to the things we're doing. On the subject of productivity, everybody, cannot get enough developers. Uh, developer time is really scarce. You never have enough developers to uh, actually staff all the projects that you want to get to. So anytime we can increase developer productivity and increase developer focus and happiness, it's a big win for an organization. And that's why we're so excited about GitHub Copilot, because we're seeing that GitHub Copilot is making coders more productive. So much so that we're seeing that 46% of new code is now being written by AI. 
predictor, uh, developers are 55% more productive and 75% of them are saying that they're feeling like they're focused on more satisfying work. So instead of looking up regex on Stack Overflow, uh, GitHub Copilot was able to suggest things and developers are able to move faster. Now think about that. If you could get 55% more developer productivity, what new applications or what improvements would that enable you to unlock? That's what we're really excited about. And of course, we're doing this across the board. We're building this into all of our products. We're using Azure OpenAI, we're using Azure Machine Learning, Azure Cognitive Services, Azure Applied AI Services, Form Recognizer, you name it. We're building these into our products. And like I said, these are the same services that are available to you as a customer. So our financial services customers are really starting to innovate around this area as well. However, one unlikely example that might at first seem like it's not related to financial services is CarMax. And let me explain why this is relevant for financial services customers. It's a really cool example. I love this example. CarMax has a lot of user reviews for a lot of cars. You can imagine if they wanted to go read all those reviews, it would take a really long time. But as a user, it's not always the best experience to have to read every single review for every car you want to go to. So what the CarMax team was able to do is they were able to have OpenAI read all those reviews for every car, generate a meta review that highlighted what people like and don't like about the cars, and then produce those summaries for their content team, who then read and approved them and published them to the site. They estimated that this thing would have taken them about 11 years to accomplish, and they did it in a matter of months. Now think about your own organization. Think about all the content generation happening in your own organization. That content, if you could reduce the time it takes to produce a first draft, how valuable is that to you? Whether it's in customer facing uh, content, whether it's in internal documents, compliance teams, this is the sort of thing we're seeing our clients start to experiment with. Uh, and some of our customers are actually making great progress in doing so to get that first draft out faster. Use that AI co-pilot to enable their people to create more. And of course, one place we're seeing this in financial services, whether you're, a, whether you're an insurance company, uh, whether you're a capital markets asset manager, there's so many documents in financial services. So of course, if we can process those documents faster, it saves a lot of money, it saves a lot of time, it frees up people to do more interesting, important activities. But we can't skip it because it's a critical part of our business and we can't get it wrong. So that's where we're seeing a lot of use in document process automation. And as I've shown here, we're using a number of our services from Azure Form Recognizer to extract that base data, putting it in an Azure Cognitive Search Index to make it available and searchable across, across uh, domains by different individuals, adding met additional metadata, many of which are generated by AI, and then taking that and passing it to the Azure OpenAI service to do things like summarize the content. Do I need to read this at all? Can you help me understand this content? And of course, visualizing all the metadata of that to understand how people are interacting with the data. We're seeing that banks and insurance companies and capital markets companies are accelerating how much they can process in a given period of time. Now, again, we're also seeing that everybody has a contact center. Everybody has long waits and they're trying to improve uh, their customer service. They want to enable more self-service. They want to use chatbots, uh, and sometimes chatbots are limited, and they want to hand it to a human agent. So how do we make those chatbots better? How do we make the handoff to a human agent better? How do we make it so that the human agent has more information to make better decisions faster? And this is what we're seeing in the call center space, is that we're able to use our speech-to-text technology to transcribe everything people are saying, including speaker diarization, where it says speaker A, speaker B. And then we're use, able to use Azure OpenAI service to do things like summarize the conversation. What's the, converse, what's the customer actually asking for? If you're handing off from a chatbot, summarize what the conversation with the chatbot was for the customer. Or if you're just trying to understand general trends across these conversations, feeding those transcripts and understanding that information and pumping it into Power BI or your CRM is incredibly valuable as well. So now we wanna talk about how customers are starting to experiment and build in their own environments. And again, what's really cool about this is it is an experimental iterative process of building. You start with a prompt, you start with a simple prompt and you build from there and see how far you can get. 
And as you start to refine your uh, prompts with examples and doing few shot learning where you're providing, hey, if I ask you this kind of question, show me a result that looks like this, it's really powerful. And of course, if you really need to get um, really fine tuned results, we offer fine tuning as well. This iteration experiment where you start with the biggest model and then scale down and see how far you can get, this is really where we're seeing customers are starting to develop these skill sets and experimenting rapidly. And they're starting to prioritize their own use cases uh, based on which of these are the most possible. This is where I love my job because I get to work and help customers figure out this process, figure out which use cases involve which capabilities. Now, of course, we're in financial services, so I would be doing us all a disservice if I did not talk about security, trust, privacy, compliance. And of course, that's the Microsoft Cloud promise, is that we run on test, uh, run on trust, and that your data is your data. We do not use your data to improve the models. We do not use your data to fine tune or improve the foundation models, even the, either the OpenAI models or the uh, Azure Cognitive Service models, and that your data is protected by the most comprehensive enterprise compliance and security controls. It's all running in your subscription. It's in your tenant. You have control. So again, when we talk about your data, your data that means your data is stored, encrypted in your Azure subscription. We're provisioning the Azure OpenAI service in your subscription, and the model fine tuning is yours and yours alone. No, no competitor is going to benefit from the prompts and responses you're sending to the model. And of course, from a data protection layer, um, we all know how secure the Azure cloud can, can be configured to be. And the last thing I want to talk about is this technology is incredibly powerful. We're, like I said, we're unlocking new waves of experiences, new capabilities that previously were not possible. Straight up, they were not possible but now they are. So this opens up new risks. New opportunities always come with new risks. And that's where Microsoft really cares deeply and OpenAI cares really deeply about our responsible AI principles and putting those to work and including those as part of every design of every project that's using AI in it. Whether that's from privacy of security of both companies and users, or whether that's through fairness, safety, transparency, accountability, we're not just talking the talk, we're walking the walk. We make tools and processes available to our customers. Uh, inside of Azure ML, for example, we make a wide range of our open source responsible AI tools available. Uh, we also have red teams that are constantly uh, investigating how to make these models safer. As we're going through this process, we're helping our customers develop their own RAI standards. And one way we're doing this is we've published our responsible AI standard that any customer can go and use. With these open AI models, these generative AI technologies, we're going to face new challenges and there's going to be new risks, but we're prepared to meet them. And we know our customers care about their own reputations and their own customer safety. So we're committed to working with our customers to understand and mitigate these risks. And what I'll say is still the best way to mitigate these risks is by having a trusted human in the loop which is why we really focus on a lot of these open AI technologies as being a co-pilot for humans to do better work. So not necessarily generating the full draft and sending it out right away, but generating that first draft where a human can provide feedback, make corrections and work faster. I wanna thank you all for taking the time to listen to me today. I'm looking forward to collaborating with many of you out there and understanding your use cases. We're just at the beginning of all of this. We're gonna see new use cases emerge, but make no mistake, this technology is here now, or we're going to see these uh, solutions move to production faster than we've ever seen it before. Thank you all. Hi, everybody. So excited to be here today, and thanks for having me. We're going to, uh, I'm going to share with you today our Document Intelligent and Azure AI and how you can use Document Intelligent to uh, do more with less. Next slide, please. So let's start with a brief history of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence AI has a long history that spans many decades. Some of the earliest work in AI was done already in 1950s and 1960s, when researchers first began to explore the possibility of creating machines that could think, like humans focused primarily on symbolic AI. In the 1990s and 2000s, AI research continued to evolve 
and, and machine learning and neural networks began. And recently we saw a big sh shift in AI uh, where generative AI began with models like GPT-3, DALI, and many more have risen and continue to advance the field of AI. Overall, AI has come a long way since its inception in the 1950s, and it continues to evolve and improve at rapid pace today. Let's see how it can be applied to document intelligence. AI is everywhere, and AI adoption and investment is up and is being applied across every industry and use case to solve real-world challenges. Uh, we can see, uh, we saw 2x in AI pri pri private investment have, uh, in one year. 5x in research and AI um, also increased. And we see it adopted everywhere. Next slide, please. After more than two years of global pandemic business and now need to navigate evolving macroeconomics, headwinds, geopolitical tension, and industry constraints of talent and labor. All of this uh, uh, faced increasingly uncertain times. During this unprecedented economic downturn, organizations are looking for ways to adopt new technologies that are easier to implement with less resources and time, and yet achieve their key business goals and do more with less. We see why implementing intelligent document automation and improving their productivity. PepsiCo are implementing sales and demand forecasting and inventory man and management. Some organizations are implementing hyper-personalization for upsales and cross-sale. Everybody's trying to do more with less, accelerate time to market, and build digital trust and improve customer experience. Let's see with this video how, uh, how these are implemented within products. Let's watch the video. Every day, artificial intelligence helps us navigate our work and personal lives in so many ways. From recognizing your face when you sign in in the morning, to making your meetings more inclusive and efficient, to helping you with daily tasks, to finding new adventures. All of this powered by Azure AI and Microsoft's decades of research and innovation. Microsoft's AI is available through our Azure AI portfolio, which means you can easily bring these same capabilities into the technology you are building as well. Azure AI brings AI within reach of every developer and data scientist, with leading models to see, hear, speak, search, and understand. And our end-to-end -end platform supports mission-critical AI scenarios from how you operate your business to how to serve your customers. Microsoft is invested in the responsible development and deployment of AI systems. Ultimately, our goal is to empower you to achieve more, whether it's at work or at play, every day. To enable all these scenarios and improve productivity, Azure AI can help. Azure AI starts from the top. In, within the application, within Microsoft 365, Microsoft Dynamics, Partner Solution, your application. It starts from the top and lets you go all the way down to the ML and the AI. After the application level, we have the application platforms like AI Builder, Power Automate, uh, Power Virtual Agent, which are our no-code applications for the business users. Then we have the Azure AI scenario-based services, such as Applied AI, like Form Recognizer for Document Intelligence, Video Indexer, uh, cognitive search for searching documents and searching your data. And then one layer down, we also have the cognitive services and, the co and cognitive services and the customized AI models with vision, speech, language, decision, and the new Azure Open AI service. And then developers and data science can also build their own and train their own machine learning models with AML and Azure machine learning. So basically, Azure AI enables you to go all the way from the top to the bottom to the advanced data science with code, no code, low code, all parts. Next slide, please. As you all are familiar with, Microsoft and OpenAI partnered to enable um, AI in all layers. With four, four models today are available, the G GPT-3 that generates and understand text, Codex that generate and understand codes, Dolly that generates and understand images from text prompts, and ChatGPT that generates and understand chat. Next slide, please. And with all these models and all these AI capabilities, the, the, the potential is limitless. You can generate code with a few lines of input. You can generate images with, with a few lines of input. 
You can answer questions. You can have generate writing assisting, help writing contracts, help understanding pay stubs, um, extracting insights, the possibilities and the ways you can improve and pr improve your productivity and understand documents and your data is limitless today. Next slide. And you can deliver more with Azure AI. It's accessible, AI for any environment. It's repeatable. So basically you can build in using Rick through research and you can put it in all your application and it's trusted and responsible. And we, we, try, we have responsible AI within all our Azure AI in order to make sure that our AI is responsible, trustable, and ethical. Next, please. So going to our topic, how can I use AI in document intelligence and what use cases we do we see? One of the use cases is content generation, where you want to have a, doc, you have a document and you want to generate content on top of it. Imagine, for example, a, a, CV or a CV or an ADHR document, and you want to create a cover letter for it. Today, you can basically say generate a cover letter and cover letter and create a cover letter on top of your CV. You can summarize documents for financial report, for example. You can easily take financial report and summarize them. You can understand documents and automate your processes like procurement to pay, extract information from invoices, extract information from pay stubs. And you can also search and do semantic search and knowledge management and knowledge mining on top of all of your data. So basically the scenarios you have, we have today uh, that we saw have content generation, summarization, understanding, and semantic search. Hi, everyone. Today, I want to quickly show you how we are bringing OpenAI's powerful models into the Azure ecosystem to help developers both iterate faster and satisfy their enterprise requirements. Here you can see the Azure OpenAI Studio, which we built to help all skill levels prototype their ideas and bring their creativity to life. With our Studio UI and the flexible models from OpenAI, you can iterate up different use cases with the same models in UI. For example, here I'm going to ask the model to extract information from an email by including both the email and my question written in natural English. Or I'm going to ask the same model to convert a paragraph description of fruits on an imaginary planet into a structured tabular format. In my third example, we'll use the same model again to classify news articles. Finally, We'll use a different model, our Codex models, to generate documentation on the provided Python function, but still within the same UI. Once developers progress further in their journey, they can easily transition from this prototyping to fine tuning and customizing their models all within the UI. Finally, when developers are ready to move towards a production application, they can leverage some of the more unique aspects of the Azure service compared to OpenAI's. We provide key enterprise promises with network security, privacy, and responsible AI tooling. For example, we enable authentication through Azure Active Directory so customers can securely access their fine-tuned models. In order to build a document intelligence solution that does all the above, we, you can use document intelligence for Form Recognizer and Azure OpenAI. You can basically ingest all the documents with Azure Form Recognizer and then use Azure OpenAI to ad addition, do additional things like generate cover letters, report generation, summarization, table classification. Combining all these capabilities from Azure AI enables you to easily start doing document intelligence on top of your data. Next slide, please. So for example, document content generation, you can see that in, in, you can use that above solution architecture that was shown to do document content generation and input the document and generate content about, on top of it. For example, a cover letter. Next slide. You can also do document summarization using this document. For example, you can see that you can summarize this document with a simple text prompt. And you can also do document understanding and extract key value pairs uh, using Form Recognizer to automate uh, procurement to pay, to, to automate invoices, W-2s, tax scenario, contracts, or any other scenario. So the benefits is, first of all, it increases efficiency. You can easily extract information from documents. You can easily create summarization, generate text. It's faster time to realize value. It enhances your customer experience and provides your customers easy access to the documents, understanding of their documents. It's easy to use. It ensures our data privacy and security. Everything runs on top of Azure. Everything is compliant, has HIPAA support, GDPR support. It's trusted and, and complies to our responsible AI. 
It does not require the long and tedious process to implement and put into production. There is less training of the data. You can do everything with no training at all, usually. And your ability to perform text analytics and generation tasks on top of your data and documents easily. So to, for the next step, you can start using the service by going here. And you can start thinking of your use cases and your scenarios to implement document intelligence in your organizations. Thank you very much. Uh, have a nice day and looking forward to see how you can implement this in your scenarios and your organizations. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rishi Arora, and I'm a data and AI specialist director within Capital Markets. I actually share um, a historic affinity towards Nudesic's document intelligence platform um, as the inspiration for it came within a project that I worked on jointly with Nudesic, actually. And it was for the NBA, the National Basketball Association, some years ago. Um, as a result of that work, um, a platform to extract the, abstract the full complexity of stitching together different natural language-based cognitive services was created by Nudesic and became leveraged by a number of uh, companies in the financial services space. Um, and so out of all the areas in AI, um, I have actually taken a deep interest within natural language processing that mimics human, human communication and enables greater productivity. Um, and now with the advent of large, uh, large language models like GPT 3.5 and beyond, uh, there's no question that adoption of such models will become integrated in applications and processes within all enterprises. Um, the key is how fast companies will actually be able to adopt the solutions like Nudesic's document intelligence platform integrated with Azure AI services. Um, the rate towards integrating that large language models will only accelerate by, by an order of magnitude. So when we talk to our customers about Azure OpenAI, we generally categorize their use cases within four major buckets. They're within the they're within these several use cases um, consisting of content generation, summarization, code generation, and semantic search. So the capital markets field it, it's a complex and, and, and dynamic field that involves analyzing vast amounts of data to make informed decisions about investments, risk management, and trading strategies. Um, in recent years, there's been a growing interest in using AI and machine learning techniques to help financial pro professionals, um, even back office professionals, process and interpret data more effectively. So here's some of the you know, potential benefits of using content generation capabilities in the capital markets industry, right? So within efficient, to conduct efficient research and analysis, so OpenAI can be trained to understand complex financial concepts and trends and to generate reports, summaries, and insights from large volumes of data. This can save analysts and traders time and effort by automating tasks such as data gathering, analysis, and summarization. Another area where it could help is in improved decision-making. OpenAI, Azure OpenAI can help financial professionals make better informed decisions by providing insights, recommendations based on historical data and market trends. Azure OpenAI can also generate scenario-based analysis to help traders, portfolio managers, understand the potential outcomes of different investment strategies. Another area where Azure OpenAI helps is in the enhanced customer experience, which I've highlighted here, right? It can help financial institutions provide better customer service by gener generating personalized recommendations, summaries, reports for individual customers. This can help customers make more informed decisions about their investments and improve their overall experience with the institution. Another area is in you know, creating more accurate forecasting. Uh, Azure OpenAI can be trained to analyze historical data and identify patterns and trends that may be useful in predicting future market movements. This can help traders and portfolio managers make more accurate forecasts and develop better trading strategies. And then finally, 
uh, in the area of reduced risk. Open AI, Azure OpenAI can help financial institutions identify potential risks and patterns in the market by analyzing vast amounts of data and generating insights that may not be immediately apparent to human analysts. This can help institutions reduce their exposure to risk and make more informed investment decisions. Now, here are some examples where Azure OpenAI's summarization capabilities are benefiting customers within the capital market sphere in the area of time saving. Summarization capabilities can help analysts and traders save time by quickly summarizing large volume of financial news and data into a concise and, and relevant summaries. Another area is in better decision making. By using Azure OpenAI summarization capabilities, analysts and traders can quickly get a high level overview of, of the most important market moving events of the day, allowing them to make better informed decisions. And finally, around increased efficiency, Azure OpenAI summarization capabilities can help analysts and traders prioritize their workload by quickly identifying the most important news data points, allowing them to work more effectively. Let's talk about semantic search. There are several benefits of using OpenAI semantic search capabilities in the capital markets industry. Some of those benefits include increased efficiency. Semantic search capabilities can help to streamline and automate many processes in the capital markets industry, such as trade monitoring, compliance checks, and risk analysis. This can lead to increased efficiency and productivity, as well as reduced costs. Another area is in improved accuracy. The advanced language capabilities can help to accurately interpret and analyze large volumes of unstructured data, such as news articles, research reports, and social media posts. This again can help to improve the accuracy and timeliness of market analysis, trading decisions, and risk assessments. And finally, for the area of re regulatory compliance, semantic search capabilities can help to ensure compliance with regulatory requirements such as monitoring for insider trading, ma market manipulation, and other forms of misconduct. This can help to reduce the risk of fines, legal action, and reputational damage. So here are some examples of multiple model use cases. This is, this is examples where customers bring up a particular use case, and we actually stitch together different AI services, even services within the Azure OpenAI realm to complete their outcome. In this case, we have end-to-end -end call center analytics, which um, consists of a classification uh, model, a sentiment model, an entity extraction model, a summarization model, as well as an email generation model. And then finally, around customer 360, we create hyper personalization around uh, around individual customers, creating timely summarization of customer queries, tens, trends, search, and content generation. And also around the area of business process automation, right? We could we could allow customers to search through structured and unstructured documentation, saving a, a boatload of time to uh, more productive, to, to serve for other more productive purposes. And the other area, which I did not mention um, that OpenAI can, can solve for is in the area of code generation. Now imagine not knowing how to write a single line of code and you need to write a, a, a SQL statement to extract data from a database. Well, now you could get that from the Codex model in Azure OpenAI. You could actually write a natural language summary of what you'd like to extract from a database and out will come the SQL query from which you can uh, provide to a database and get a generated output. So when selecting a use case for financial services or even within capital markets, here's some use cases to avoid. Right. It's not designed to pr process numerical calculations. Right. These are auto regressive models that are th that take history of text and pr and predict what's what's the upcoming text. Um, they you know, they typically don't provide real time information 
and 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 they don't replace sophisticated risk models. So avoid use cases that have real regulatory impact or oversight. While you can create um, a writing assistance, writing summary assistance uh, in the in the area of regulatory risk and compliance, it's not designed to automate the such use cases. Um, so that's why we we always warn that you know these generative AI models are meant to be a co-pilot for folks who are uh, knowledgeable within the domain they are working in. So again, use cases to avoid are around risk modeling, credit scoring, and underwriting. Some use cases to evaluate for generative AI models within Azure OpenAI um, are, involve cases where there's text an analysis needed, summarization, forms or content generation, um, and then also information discovery and knowledge mining, right? So the idea is, really to start really small and then build on the use case from there right there's a there's there's an old adage right don't boil the ocean in this case definitely not right start very start with a very small use case tinker around with the hyper parameters of the open ai models that are available to you and then work from there so to go a little bit further um, as it relates to content generation and summarization, the top two areas in which our customers are using Azure OpenAI, they generally use it for writing assistance to expand on bullet points or enable a first draft, right? Some sample use cases could be creating content around industry, brand or product reviews, or even creating zip brochures, um, creating email prospecting uh, templates, writing catchy subject lines, developing announcements or other communications. And in the area of summarization, identifying key takeaways or salient points from text ex expert ex excerpts, uh, quarterly calls, uh, quarterly earnings calls, and generating succinct summaries. So again, while there are a plethora of use cases across the financial services space, Let's double click on some very specific use cases that are specific to our customers within capital markets, starting from the bottom most row. One area which we touched on was in the area of client engagement. NLP or natural language processing, large language models are designed to really understand process natural language text, allowing for more efficient and accurate communication between clients and industry professionals. This can improve client engagements by enabling faster response times, enable more personalized recommendation, and enhance the understanding of complex financial concepts. Sentiment analysis. These large language models available through Open, Azure OpenAI can be trained to analyze a sentiment in client communications, allowing for more effective risk management and predictive analytics. This again can help financial institutions better understand client needs, behavior, and identify potential risks or opportunities in the market. With respect to chatbots, right? We all, we all have been exposed to chatbots and how greatly inefficient they can be. However, these large language models can be used to develop these chatbots and provide answers to real queries and provide salient answers to these queries, providing support around the clock this can improve client engagement even more by, by providing a more convenient and effective means of communication. These large language models can also provide benefits for investor report or pitch book generation. Think about the time savings. One of the key benefits of using these large language models for investor report generation is that they could save a significant amount of time, right? Um, instead of spending hours writing reports from scratch, these large language models can generate reports in a matter of minutes. The consistency also matters. These large language models can provide a high level of consistency in the language and the structure of investment reports. It could particularly be important for large investment firms where multiple people may be involved in the report writing process. 
But again, these large language models can ensure that all these reports have a consistent tone and structure. Coverage. Large language models can help to also improve the coverage of investor reports. They can analyze large amounts of data, including financial data, providing inf insights that might be missed by human analysts. This again can help investors make more informed decisions. So large language models can al also offer several benefits around market surveillance. Here are some of the potential advantages. Improve detection of emerging risk potential market abuses. These large language models can analyze large volumes of financial market data, including news articles, social media posts, regulatory filings to identify potentially fraudulent or manipulative behavior. By analyzing the text data, these models can identify patterns, anomalies that human analysts may miss, allowing regulators to more effectively monitor and enforce market rules. Now we come to the topic of responsible AI. While there is great power that sits with these generative AI large language models resident in Azure OpenAI, there comes a great responsibility to manage this technology as well, especially for our customers in the capital market space, which is why Microsoft has invested the past several years in developing responsible AI practices in order to be prepared to manage each wave of new AI innovation that takes place within our own company, as well as that of our customers. Here are specific methods that we implement where we implement responsible AI mitigations. These responsible AI mitigations fall into a few different buckets. The first bucket is, is the customer implementation. While there are things that OpenAI service can do as a platform team, some mitigations are scenario specific and must be implemented by the customer, building on top of Azure OpenAI. To help with this, the Azure OpenAI uh, tr service transparency note communicates system capabilities, known limitations, and required responsible AI mitigations and recommended design practices. The third bucket is process and policy. With every Azure OpenAI implementation at a customer, we are committed to implementing responsible AI mitigations. One mitigation can issue an alert in the event of a quality or abuse that may arise. We could learn about these through abuse and feedback channels, and a customer can quickly update its filtering technology in the case of an incident. Specifically around the content detection and filtering classifiers built to support Azure OpenAI, filtering technologies are important mitigation, but they're not a panacea and need to be paired with other elements of responsible design and responsible use. Such responsible AI mitigations are necessary whenever implementing these services. That's why we partner heavily with part, you know, some of our system integrator partners like Nudesic in the field with our capital markets customers to create these mitigation tasks. And one of the one of the items that I kind of talked about before was how we as well as Nudesic, right, partner together with our customers to really understand what their use cases are all about. And in this particular case, we have document process automation. There's some complexity in terms of stitching together these different services in order to complete this use case, which is where Nudesic's document intelligence platform thrives, right? It already has the domain specific experience built to tie into uh, cognitive services like Azure Form Recognizer, which extracts key value pairs from complex tables and forms. It already has the capability to connect directly to cognitive search to automatically index domain specific data for a given company or entity. Again, it already has those ties and hook, hooks into Cosmos DB and other databases to, to retain the requisite information. All, all in the effort of feeding this information to the OpenAI service so that it could produce a natural language like human 
response. Again, that could be served up towards a web application or even a Power BI report. And that's, I think, one of the key benefits, the key benefit of using Nudesic's document intelligence platform. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. Steve here again. Today, I get to talk a little bit about how we're seeing AI, specifically document intelligence, um, how that's playing out in the in capital markets space. We're also going to talk about not only how it's being used, but how it can be used, leveraging some of the new and exciting tech from OpenAI. When we look at document intelligence in capital markets, we, we can actually see it across a variety of different, you know, front office and back office um, facets. But if we look at just a couple that we're going to un, un, unpack that we've actually worked with some folks on, I think about onboarding, right? So if we want to generate proposals based off of someone's existing investment statements, we can figure out what the risk profile is, and then we can figure out how to actually package something up that's going to be appealing to them without requiring a significant amount of input from them. We can also talk about onboarding that end-to-end -end process, whether it's going to be the KYC portions of it, whether it's going to be just the ingestion of all of the different transfer forms and things like that. that. That is something that we can really accelerate. And by doing this quickly, we can not only predict customer churn, but we can help prevent it by getting fast responses and being very um, customer obsessed. When we kind of move to the trading functionality, there's a couple different things that we've actually seen that are pretty interesting use cases there, whether it is just the actual kind of zero, zero, try, talk, blah, zero touch trade reconciliation or completion, as well as trader surveillance, as well as settlement automation, and then market analysis, right? How can we figure out the right information at the right time? We're actually going to do a pretty interesting deep dive on that when I get to the in demo portion of it, where we're going to show how OpenAI can not only help with the extraction and enrichment of the documents that we get, but also the search interaction functionality as, as well. And then finally, if we think about risk and compliance, that's where we have you know, contract analysis, supportive audits, know your customer, fraud detection, all of those things that are regulated and that we need to make sure that we're on top of are functions that are able to be accelerated using intelligent document processing. If we look at the overall journey and how this usually works from, you know, like the first light bulb bright idea all the way to an enterprise solution at scale, it kind of goes through three phases, right? So you've got your near term phase. That's where we've got our first pilot, our first proof of value, that MVP, where we're going to be looking to solve a specific use case, very, very targeted. And we're usually going after either um, efficiency, operational efficiency, or we're going to go after increased accuracy, risk minimization, you know, consistency across the board. Those are things that we're going to get in that first use case. Then we're going to go kind of to the intermediate term where once that's been successful and we've seen the value, we've seen the ROI, and we've started to realize and really capture that, then we're going to start to scale this up. Right? So we're going to start to onboard additional use cases and run them at scale across different business, use it, business units, across different functions in order to solve multiple problems. That's really like the second phase where we kind of really land and expand the overall functionality because we've got that solid foundation that's, that is solid, extensible platform. Then we've got the long-term value generation. So not only are we able to automate things to, you know, sort of really get those additional efficiencies, minimize risk. But then once we have all these different data points coming together, we could really look at actually creating potentially new data products, generating new insights from bringing all of this data that was previously trapped inside documents into a holistic solution in order to solve some next level in problems and generate potentially even data products. So there's some really interesting cases there as well. But fundamentally what this problem is, is that documents are super complicated. 
right? They have text and they have graphs and they have charts and they have tables and a variety of different things combined into a single package. Not only do you have that one document can be really complicated, but if you think about an onboarding package or a know your customer package that has all of that different content in it around the identification, around investment statements, around you know all of the different document types that are required in order to complete that function, that really is not just one document that you get, it's a, what we call a multi-class document. And for a multi-class document, what you need to do is before you can even you know start to get value out of any of the sub-document types, you actually have to split it up. And that's one of the things that our platform also does very well, is allow you to understand multiple document types in a single package and also it allows you to use multiple services to solve complicated problems out of the box i'm going to show you exactly which ones we support 10 of the azure cognitive services that can be composed in parallel and serial fashion in order to solve very nuanced problems if we look specifically kind of at what our solution does which we call the document intelligence platform which was jointly developed with Microsoft about four and a half years ago. What it does is it starts with the really input ingestion. So we support, you know, there's obviously manual, manual upload, there's FTP inter integration, there's API endpoints, there is file folder scrapers, there's SharePoint event receivers, there's email capture, there's a variety of different ways, dynamics um, receivers as well that we can take documents and then process them through the actual platform. And that really is kind of a six step processing um, approach. So we start with our pre-processing. Do we need to standardize any of those in documents? Do we need to check for duplicates? Um, do we need to do any of that sort of, you know, pre-processing that, that needs to happen in order for any of the further steps to happen successfully? Once that's happened, then we go to classification. So we can classify at two different levels. We can classify at the document level. This is a bank statement, this is an investment statement, this is a driver's license, you know, this is a legal contract, this is a 10K, or we can go at the actual page level. So previously when I was talking about multi-class documents, what we actually do is instead of classifying the document as one individual thing, because it's really not, we classify each individual page and then we group those pages together, right? So that's how we, in classification works. After that, we're gonna move on to extraction. And extraction is really just about like raw data extraction. So we're getting all of the raw data out and we're getting it in context. So we're able to extract tables and key value pairs and paragraphs and signatures and a variety of different elements that we're gonna walk through and we're able to extract them with up to those 10 different cognitive services that I was referring to, but they really aren't in a format that can be consumed yet. Then we support transformation modules or webhooks, which is really just a RESTful API call that can either be integrated into the system or an external API that we reference that will help shape the content uh, using kind of you know standard means, business rules, et cetera, into a way that's going to make sense either to the people who are going to be consuming it or the machines that are going to be con consuming it. From there, we, we get to the next level, and this is really where things like OpenAI play a fantastic role, and that's at the enrichment layer. So now we have the data extracted out, but now we want to get meaning out of it. We want to get those next level insights. We want to infer things. We want to generate a summary. We want to do smart things with what we've extracted, right? That's what's going to happen at the enrichment layer. That would be in the private wealth on onboarding example. If we were going to generate a risk profile score based off of an investment, that risk profile would, would be a machine learning module that would fit into the en enrichment layer. Finally, the whole point of intelligent document processing solutions is to automate things end-to-end. -end. So we need a validation module that gives us the opportunity to auto-validate documents as they come through. We don't want to have 
each individual document still requiring human touch, right? It may be something where we have an exception that gets kicked out. And we're going to talk about some of the different ways we can actually do that from the very basic, which is every required field in this document type or document class has a value in it, right? Very, very straightforward. And we can get more and more advanced based off of the specific document types, specific business function as well. We can bring in compliance rules, business rules, engines, arithmetics, and things like that. Finally, we've got the data out. Now we need to do something fun with it. And that's where the output integrations come in. So we're going to take a, whoops, take a little bit of a, uh, uh, Let's let's pause it here, Rachel, um, and then I'm just going to start over from the end of this slide. Okay, so from the end of this slide, so like 14 on the dot, 1350, something like that. I don't know what the actual time is because I can't I'll figure see it, it out. But I'll as I talk about output integrations and doing something interesting with it. Okay, so uh, yeah, no problem. I'll make a note, and then we're, you're going to pick it up here. Yeah, I'm going to pick it up right here. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. So this is the base uh, screen of the document intelligence platform. It's got three main portions that, that we should really look at here. It's got the ability to build advanced you know, composite models, which we're going to walk through how we actually do it. We call each one of those a document type. It's got the ability to process them. Right, so there's an orchestration engine that goes through those six steps that I walked you through. And then it's got the ability to actually, you know, kind of operationalize these, these things at scale. So let's dive right in and let's go to the creation of document types. So you can see here all of the different document types that I've, that, that I've got. This is my demo environment. So I've got a bunch. Let me just pull up the investment statement here. So you can see on the left hand side, you can see all of the different training documents that we have, you know, different formats, different companies, things coming in. On the right hand side, you can see all of the different tags that we've created. So a tag is really just a data point that we're looking to extract. Tags can be of a, a variety of different types. As an example, if I were to add a new tag here, we would give it a name. Tag A, very meaningful. And then if we look at the different types, it can be it can be text, it can be table, it can be checkbox, it can be an array. And there's additional functionality that's actually possible now if we switch the extraction module right to either Q and A or NER. That's how we get those next level insights. There is by layering in some of that functionality as well. So we're able to um, really get all of that information. We can also set not, not only the type of entity, like what we're looking to get out, like whether it's a text entity, you know, or array, we can set the data type as also. And this actually plays into one of our validation functions, which I actually forgot to mention, which is around type checking. So we can check to see if what we've extracted is actually a valid date or a valid time or an integer, currency, string, things like that. We're also layering in actively the innovation team now is working on building in regular expression validation just so that we can have certain format checks, whether it's a driver's license, social security number format, any sort of thing that could be captured with a regular expression. Just another way that we can validate and ensure that we're getting consistent, correct data. So it's either going to be mandatory or optional, which we can select here. And then it can be single instance or multi-instance. What this really means, a lot of the cognitive services, what they'll do is they will give you the best result that they have. But the reality is there might be multiple correct answers inside a document. There may be multiple company names. There may be multiple deal names. A lot of the times when we do back office automation and we are looking at automating trades, there will be five trade orders in one document. So we need to be able to capture each one of those. So we're going to use multi-instance objects. So after that, we can also add individual webhooks if we need to. And that's the kind of integrations that we have. 
I'm just going to cancel out of here, right? And that's how we add an individual tag. But let's take a peek at how this is actually configured overall. So what we've got here is a couple of the different operationalization functions. A big concern that a lot of my customers have is how long is my data going to stay in the cloud, right? I'm concerned about that. So we give the ability to really manage that pro proactively where you can say negative one for your retention policy, which means it's going to stay indefinitely. Zero, which means as soon as it's validated, either automatically or manually, it's going to be deleted or end days, which is going to be, we're gonna keep that for 7, 14, whatever the business calls for as far as the actual end days. Then we get down to the extraction modules here and you can see what's been configured as far as the extraction modules. We can drag and drop these over. We have the ability to not only make them serial, but we can make them parallel as well, right? So this would be serial. If I added another one over, that would make it parallel. Right, so if I wanted to add the invoice module and have it run in parallel to forms recognizer, it would look like this. If I wanted it to be another serial run, it would look like this as well, right? So we have the ability to really easily configure how that workflow is going to be created. When we first started doing these, creating these loosely coupled work workflows and leveraging multiple cognitive services to solve a problem took engineer weeks meaning it took multiple engineers, multiple weeks to, cre to create one document type, which we can now have an analyst create that in document type, try a bunch of different configurations of cognitive services in an afternoon, train it, and actually be good. So we have different types of models, so we can select whether we want to for forms recognizer use the neural or template version that's new with forms recognizer ver version three different ones have have different pros and cons this is the baseline configuration that we have and i'm going to walk through that a bit later because this actually plays into our reporting functionality which is very key if you want to keep an eye not only on the value that you're generating or capturing right so you can you know make sure that that even business case is actively monitored, but also the cost and the performance is, is something that, that you can actively look after here as well. Then we can layer in transformations where it makes sense. We can add in additional validations. Again, we have the investments, the bank statements, et cetera, and then destinations. So we support out of the box. If I wanted this to be pushed to a knowledge mining portal, Right, I'm just gonna click on that. And then now what's really interesting here is I can actually shape the output. So I want the investor name, but I really don't want that to be called investor name because my system's not gonna like that. I'm just gonna call that investor, right? Then you can change that. And then you can push over the account summary, the account number, and you have the ability to really shape what's actually coming out. And then you can define metadata that can be passed through as well. And what that really means is if you wanted to pass, let's say, um, a source system ID, right, where this in document came from, let's say it came from CRM and it's flowing through the actual system, maybe Dynamics is your case management system, right? So it has a case ID. Well, you can pass the case ID through the system and it will flow along with the document with all of the extracted metadata and then allow it to be passed through. So it's really just a metadata pass-through functionality, which allows for proper linking of content across the enterprise. So that's how we actually build that model. And it's good to point out that we require a minimum of five documents. That's an Azure Cognitive Search minimum. And it depends on the variety of the underlying documents, what you're trying to extract and the complexity for the actual number that you need out of it. We've seen certain simple cases work with as small as five. We've seen some more that have a, like a massive variety require up to 50 or 100 documents. But once we tag those, we're gonna go through and we're gonna train them. Now, the important part of, about training is, I just showed you that we can have up to 10 cognitive services. We need to actually version all of this document set and all of our training content 
and keep track of all the versions and all of those underlying models that make up that version of the document type. So we've encapsulated all of that into our training functionality, but not only that, in order to support like a proper development life cycle, we have two versions of the model at any given time. So you have your training version, which is up top here for testing, then you have your published version, which is for production. So there's two actual endpoints when documents come in where you can specify whether this is going to be a testing run or this is going to be a production run. So now we can iterate, we can apply human in the loop training while we are still processing documents in production in a safe manner. As an example, if we were to go try to publish a document, we're actually gonna see a report here of what's changed so that we know what we, what we need to do or if this actually needs to be republished or retrained. As you can see here, there's nothing actually different. It would have been called out if it, if it was. So we're just gonna cancel that because we don't need to publish. Once we're done, then we can go back and we can actually look and see here what some of these documents look like. So I'm gonna look at a couple of the investment statements here because that's what we were looking at. And you can tell here just, just by the clever naming con conventions, which ones were correctly validated and which ones were not correctly validated. And the reason why is we actually changed the math on some of these, if I show you the incorrect validation here, we changed some of the numbers under the covers so that this validation result, right, doesn't actually match. So you can see the uh, output and then you can see the actual comment here as well, right? So you can see how we're actually validating things and how those validation rules get applied and then what action is actually taken off of it. So it gives you some data so that you can actually find out what's going on. Then if we look at one that's been correctly validated, what we have here, is let me get the right one. All right, so if we look at the validation result is right here. So you can see that the validation actually happened correctly because there's no error putting out and the and the status is actually set to validated, not to rejected, right? So you can see the numbers here are in fact different and that's because of the overall math. Now that we've kind of talked about your base case, you know, kind of your standard structured document, like an investment statement or a bank statement or a financial statement, we can start to talk about some of the more interesting things. So let me show you what we did to support kind of the market analysis use, use case. So what we've done is we've taken some annual reports, we've taken some 10Ks and some 10Q documents, and we've created a model for each one of them. And then we've loaded them into an Azure Cognitive Search interface, and we have a knowledge mining portal on top of it. So let's go in here and let's look into some of the interesting functionality that's actually embedded in some of these document types. So I'm going to pull up, let me grab an annual report. So we've got a couple tags here and we've got some annual reports on the left hand side. And we've got the company name, we've got the title and we've got the tag but we're actually using OpenAI as a skills in order to generate some additional tags that aren't even going to be here. So when, when I show this to you in the actual knowledge mining portal, what you're going to see is not only a company name and a title and the uh, you know year, but you're gonna see a couple of different things. So what we've got for the title is we've got, this is actually a generated title that OpenAI is actually generating. So it's going to look at the content of this file and it's gonna generate a title, which is just like a single sentence descriptor of what this document actually is. Um, some of them just had like PDF names as the uh, in title, so we wanted to make sure that it was more robust and more human readable and understandable. So you can see that we've got here as this extraction type, we're actually using open AI. So we're not tagging it directly. Phrases defined. And then these are all of the different configurations that we have. So we're actually doing a Q&A. And then what is the title of this in document? This is how we're actually generating that. It's pretty straightforward. There's a variety of different things that we can do using open AI. We actually support, my goodness, I think eight out of the box now. This is growing every day whether it's Q&A, 
whether it's summary, we can actually extract structured data, which I'm gonna show for the 10Ks and, and 10Qs, um, and a few different things. So there's some really interesting things we can configure at the tag level, leveraging OpenAI. So this is the base case just for the annual report. Let's now look at the 10K. So let me just pull up a 10K here. So I'm just gonna filter. 10K. All right. Okay, so here's our 10K. All right, so this gets a little bit more interesting here as, as well. So we've got the title, which is, which is similar, right? So we've got the same title here, and then we've also got a few other things that are interesting. What's a good one to show you? So we've got the fiscal year and we've got that. We actually extract the financial statement data, but we extract that on the uh, knowledge mining portal. So as we process these, I can show you what each one of these underlying documents looks like when they come through the system. And let's just pull up a 10K here. This is what actually come, comes out. We've got the company name, we've got the fiscal year, we've got the title, um, all that fun stuff. Right now, let me show you one other thing in the document type. Let me show you how the destination is actually configured because these are configured to go to Azure Cognitive Search. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just go back and click on the configuration setting here. There we go. And if we look here, how it's actually configured, we can see that the cognitive search destination here is configured. And that's just having this, this link here and having that set up, right? We can look at the output format and see what's going over. All right, let's hide that. And that's how we can actually configure all of those destinations just by that simple interaction. Right. So now let's go look and see how open AI can really revolution revolutionize your enterprise search. So this is our basic search portal here. Right. What this really is, is just kind of a summary of the overall in documents. We can search by a variety of different things. Let me just go to the home page here so we can bring that up. All right. So let's say, I don't know, I want to look for Bank of America. For some reason I have caps lock on because I like to type with caps lock. So let's, these are the different documents that we have. This is the generated title from OpenAI. Let's just grab one of these here. So this is, right, that annual report. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to take that out. I'm just going to make it Bank of America so we can see all of those documents. Now we have the ability. This is all of the documents that have Bank of America of America mentioned either in the company name, which is one of the tags, one of the entities that we extracted, or in the or in the content, right? So here you can see how it's actually coming up in the in the content. This is actually not a document around Bank of America, but JP Morgan also says bank and America and of a lot. This is going to be a lower confidence score, but since we only have seven documents that we're actually showing here, that's why we have that. We can also filter this by a variety of different facets, company name, fiscal year, et cetera. So this is all the Bank of, um, of America content. Interesting to know here, so this title is generated by OpenAI. This summary is generated by OpenAI. And if we click on any one of these underlying documents, let's grab a 10K, we can see here a couple different things. So on the right-hand side, we have all of the document level content, on the left hand side, we have all the page level content. So what we've actually done is using open AI functionality and embedding that into Azure Cognitive Search skills, we have generated a document summary, right? So this is a summary of what that document is. We have generated, or actually these are the entities that we just brought over from the advanced modeling functionality. So that's all been pushed through as metadata. These are the financial statements that we actually leveraged OpenAI in order to extract. And we've got 
a variety of different data points. We've got the year, we've got the year data, and then we've also got a variety of different years. So we can actually support like year minus one and things like that. So this is just a very flexible way that we can extract data points out and then we can serve them up, right? So here you can see, you know, just the different revenue, the net income, the total assets, li liabilities. That's what this table is here. Uh, you can also see what it looks like on page two. Interestingly here, right, these are all financial data points that are extracted from this document. However, this isn't a table. It's not extracting structured data. It's actually pulling those data points out of that like typed paragraph content and then surfacing them up, giving you the ability to like quickly at a, at a glance, look at that. So we can see where all of the financial numbers are, again, coming out of the overall content, right? So we can just look through some of these. Let me actually see if I can find another financial document. These are some pretty big, big files here, so I'm not going to go through all of them. But uh, as you can see, there's a lot of value that can be extracted here. This is something else that's like pretty cool. So what we did was we leveraged OpenAI again to generate a Q&A that this document can actually answer. So these are all questions that are answered in this document. And you can obviously ask any one of them, but we've pre-got the actual answers for it. So you can see um, you can see the actual answers at a glance to these questions. Now, these are just generic questions that we actually had OpenAI generate a list of questions that this document answers and then actually ask each individual question so we can have this type of summary. But think about what else you could do with this. Think about having a targeted list of risk and compliance questions. Think about the different ways that you can actually interact with it, right? Like, um, as well, we can also ask those questions live. So what are the total assets? This is actually going over the entire document now, and it's gonna show you what the total assets are. Since this is a very large document, again, it does take a while to actually go over it, but it's going to have that kind of interactive Q&A functionality. On the left-hand side, we're actually waiting for that to come back. What you can see is some of our individual page level content. Hey, Rachel, can you, we're going to probably cut it here too, because this doesn't, this demo part doesn't seem to be working. So we're going to come back okay. there. So where do you want to cut it? Just a little bit before this? So, so just cut out a little bit of the actual waiting time. Okay. And then just like show it. So before I go down to the actual page level summary and, and try to talk over it, I say something like, while we're waiting for this, you know, this is other interesting stuff that we do, just cut back to, to the actual answers. Okay. Got it. You can see it. Are you going to pick that up? Yeah, so I'm going to pick that up as if the answers just uh, came up. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Got it. All right, so now we can see here that we've got the actual answers to those in questions. So not only can we generate questions and these are pre-populated in advance, we can actually interactively within the document look for that underlying content leveraging some of the open AI functionality. So we've leveraged a lot of the metadata that was extracted from the document intelligence platform in order to find the right content. And then we're leveraging the open AI functionality in order to interrogate the right in, interrogate the document to get the right insights out of it. In addition to that, we have some, uh, some page level functionality that we've added in, right? So for each page, we give us a summary of what this page contains, which is here, as well as the actual outline. So this is a generated outline of just bullet points of the type of content that's in this page. So you can, you can look through at a glance if you just want to skim it. If you're looking for something specific, you can kind of just breeze through these outlines, see what's there, see what the uh, salient points are. But this is actually really kind of a strong example of how we can take, you know, kind of the existing Azure Cognitive Services for extraction analysis. We can process documents and then actually leverage the output and put enrichment and, you know, the new 
revolutionary open AI functionality on top of it in order to solve some of these complicated problems. We've shown here kind of like a market analysis use case, but you can imagine how this can be leveraged for a variety of different functionalities. And this is really, you know, kind of one of the most interesting parts is how we can get that out and how we can start to get those next level insights. But once we're getting those, we really need to track and manage. And that's where I'm going to show you the operational reporting portion of what we actually have. So let's go back to our platform. And now let me walk you through all of those data points that we were talking about earlier. So that's our baseline configuration. So each document type has the ability to have a baseline configuration set. So what that really means is it's going to give you some data points that will represent it. Now, it's going to support a couple main functions. First of all, business group owner, right? This is for chargeback. So if a, if a document type is owned by a business group, we can specify that business group, and then we're going to be able to separate by that in our cost reporting, in our performance reporting, in any of the reporting that we do, we have the ability to slice and dice by the actual business group business function. If you are offering your, you know, your solution as a SaaS offering, you could have your business group be an actual end customer and each one could have their own tenant just by configuring this. And then you could segregate everything that they're actually doing. Now, an important part is really tracking the overall value because typically for these types of solutions, there's a business case that is generated in order to actually create what we're what we're looking for to uh, fund it. So we have some assumptions, which we actually capture here, right? So for each demand letter, which is a which is an insurance legal contract or a legal demand that gets sent for a claim, it originally took 32 minutes for, for processing. We pay that person $32 an hour. And after that, someone else has to validate it for 12 for 12 minutes. That's the original use use case. When we look at the automated case, it now takes only four minutes to invalidate. The, the validator's salary is higher, however, um, and then the external validation time is things that are done outside of the system. So we take these metrics and based off of the, uh, pro of the process documents, we're actually able to generate, you know, not only the minutes saved, but the dollars saved based off of a couple different facets. One is just the you know basic arithmetic of minutes times salary for the actual value captured, but then we get a bit more advanced in the reporting and we show how that compares with the overall cost as well. And then finally, SLA. We have certain SLA re requirements in order to process in documents, and this is in, in uh, hours, so it could be eight hours, 24 hours, each of these documents have a turnaround time, and these all push not only chargeback and things like that in the reporting layer, but they will calculate the total time saved, the total value dollars saved captured. You can look at the overdue tasks. This is all driven by the SLA. So we can just filter based off of that if you're looking for that, um, as well as uh, you know some of those underlying value metrics. If we want to do a deeper dive on either the cost or the performance, then we're able to go to some of our reports here and I'll walk you through a couple of them. Let's look at our cost report. This opens up in Power BI. Now this actually gives you the ability and you could expose this at tenant level and hold on a second. Sorry, let me find the right one here. This is unusual. So we're gonna have to cut this part out here because I'm looking for the right report. I thought I was in the right spot. Got it. There we go. All right, I got it. All right. So then we're able to actually look at our reports and we're able to slice and dice at the underlying, um, you know, either business group level and things like that. But let me pull up the cost report here 
And this is the cost summary. And we actually extract out the billing data from the Azure Billing APIs, and we surface it up in a way that is able to a non-billing or is accessible to a non-billing administrator. So they can come through, they can look at the content, they can actually slice and dice, they can look at it by you know, kind of the resource group or the resource location. We can drill down to the actual underlying service types, the regions, um, and then we can look at some of the additional functionality by the services, right, by the service name, and we can slice and dice and, and drill through to a variety of different levels of detail. This gives you a single pane of glass where you can manage the cost of a solution and support chargeback for what we're actually doing. If we look at the, let me just pull up, let's say, I'll do one more report in the interest of time. Let me pull up the business value report. So here we're going to be able to see the actual business value that's been captured. So you can see the overall documents that have been processed. You can see the business groups here. Um, now, if we wanted to drill down, right, we can drill through and we can look at the underlying document types that belong to that business group, right? This is how we can support chargeback. You can see the value, you can see the underlying um, document types. We can even go a little bit deeper here if we wanted, and we can look at the underlying you know, documents and the individual steps, right? So we're able to track the business value of different document types at a different document level, at a different business group level. We can filter based off of time if we wanna do a time slice window so that we can actually give we can easily give you know, that um, business case update on a monthly basis. This month, we, we were able to capture X dollars and we saved y, y minutes. This allows you to easily give updates to the board, executive leadership, whoever has approved that case in order to you know, kind of prove value. Um, finally, actually, I, am, I, I, I lied. I'm going to show one more thing. One last report. I kind of like this one. This one's this one's pretty slick. So our performance report. If we're actually trying to figure out why something is taking so and so long, we can pull up our performance report. We have the average processing type per document type, right? If we want, we can drill through. And there's a couple different things we can do, right? We can look at the workflow process of an underlying document type. So as this comes up here, these are all the different steps that are involved in this individual document type processing. And we have the runtime of each underlying step, right? So you can drill in and you can see, you can find the actual hotspots and you can help optimize some of these things based off of what's actually taking time. So this is a medical history object and this is actually one of our longest running document types because these things are usually around 750 to a couple thousand pages. So that's, that, that's why that would definitely pop out here and why it would be identified as this hotspot. But we're able to dive in and easily find what we're looking for and be able to optimize that underlying content. So with that, I really am going to stop it here. This time, I want to thank everyone for their time. I would also say, if you'd like to see what this looks like with your content, we're more than happy to you know, have a conversation give you a demo of what the solution can do for your individual use case, and then look at potentially doing a pilot, MV, MVP, whatever makes sense. So more than happy to help you out. Feel free to reach out. Looking forward to working together. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, you've already heard sessions from the other three on this group. My name is Rachel Goodrich. I am helping moderate a little bit today for our Ask the Experts panel. Um, and with that, and without further ado, we'll hop right into the questions. If you're um, watching live on LinkedIn, LinkedIn or YouTube, feel free to drop questions in the chat and we'll try to get to those. So first question. So I'm going to ask him. Okay. So why do capital markets clients need to implement AI forward strategies? So I'll chime in here. So, you know, with respect to capital markets, you know, you know, customers need to remain competitive in the market, right? And 
um, as, as a result, they really need to take advantage of data-driven insights um, that AI can help to uh, shed light on, right? Um, you know, AI is already helping <clears throat> capital markets customers to make informed decisions, right? Identify new opportunities um, and, you know, in a very paramount way, reduce risk, right? That's one of the major items that our customers are looking to accomplish in today's uh, climate. Um, it's also helping our customers to, you know, help automate processes, you know, increase efficiency and in, you know, in light of today's economic climate, reduce costs. Thanks, Thanks for sharing. So if nobody else has anything else to add to that, I'll go ahead and move on to the next question. And this is kind of a, a broad one, but, you know, where are we seeing capital markets customers already implementing AI um, and where are they doing it, you know, most successfully? Yeah, I can jump on that one. And it sort of builds on what Rishi was just saying, actually, right? So for capital markets um, customers, right, they're sort of front office, and back office and back office. It's all about kind of automation and, and helping get your margins down, right? So we're seeing a lot of that, especially in the document intelligence space, reducing time to onboard, reducing time to, you know, get documents out to clients. That's a huge part of it. But in the front office, it's all about sort of the speed and quality of decisions, right? So you want to get the most information you can as quickly as you can, process and digest it as quickly as you can, while maintaining a sort of comprehensive view of what you're actually making decisions about. And I see that customers are really starting to use AI as that assistive tool to help them parse through more content, more information, more signals. And even whether that's in fundamental investing, where you take that and then you're still making sort of a more manual decision making process, or if it's in a more quant forward way to everything in between, we're seeing AI is feeding these inputs so that the investment decisions across the board can be more informed by more data points at faster velocities. And like Rishi said, we're seeing that customers are doing this to maintain their competitive advantage uh, because you, they have to move fast in today's day and age. Yeah, I think that makes, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, Charles. Um, you know, we, you know, today we already hear, right. Whenever we turn on CNBC, you know, some reference to algorithmic trading, right. That's already taking, that has been taking place for the past, you know, several years now. Right. Um, that level of automation is, is there today um, with a high degree of confidence. Um, although, you know, when, when I actually participate in customer conversations with Charles, a lot of the AI that we're focused on, and Charles coins this very well, is like, you know, you, he always emphasizes this in calls we have with customers, you know, it's a, it's a co-pilot to what you're actually trying to achieve, right? So, you know, we're, we're hearing, we're talking to customers every day about, you know, how they want to implement or use machine learning to optimize portfolios, identify market trends, detect anomalies, but that always comes with the co-pilot, right? Someone, <clears throat> someone like a human in the loop to help assist with that um, because there could be errors in, involved. So it's, it's, it's definitely, while it increases efficiency um, and increases insights, it also um, can, you know, per perhaps introduce new levels of risk as well. So it's, very important for, you know, domain subject matter experts to be involved in that process. I've actually also seen it used in, in the um, space of really creating new differentiated user ex experiences. So being able to onboard customers faster, being able to provide better customer service, give them kind of that right answer at the right time not necessarily unique to uh, capital markets. I've seen it across industries, but I've also seen it add a lot of value here as well. Yeah. Thanks guys. I, you know, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say like, Steve, that's a great point, especially in the institutional <laughs> space where, you know, the, the clients that are involved have massive sums of money and they're very high touch, very high quality, but there's a ton of sort of compliance and, and documentation requirements, right? That is where, you know, if you can answer questions more quickly, if you can kind of uh, tailor your responses to specific ways that that account asks that question, that onboarding process can streamline much faster, which means that, you know, accounts get funded much faster and therefore the investment process can go and there's less lost time whenever a 
uh, you know, new funds are being added to, uh, you know, institutional base. Nice. Richie, I want to I want to go back to something that you said, Richie, related to risk. Do we how do we see um, AI filling in, you know, the gaps in, you know, identifying and mitigating risk for these customers? And that's kind of an open question to everyone. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, machine learning models today, right? They're analyzing these large data sets, right? I mean, talk about talking about equity prices, um, even equity trades uh, that are coming across, right? They're looking for fraudulent activity, for example, right? Um, it, you know, these algorithms are excellent at detecting patterns um, and then suggesting perhaps, you know, what, you know, you know, surfing, surfacing those anomalies to, you know, top level analysts um, and even identifying patterns from a trading strategy standpoint, right? Um, about, you know, making those predictions about future market movements. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's some of our customers are using like, uh, you know, these kind these kind of data sets and, and, and um, you know, mitigating market risk by, uh, perhaps utilizing other risk management strategies, such as like automate, uh, automated hedging, right? Um, that can help reduce the impact of uh, market volatility. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, AI can be used in a variety of different like risk models and then, you know, which obviously help identify potential risks. And then, you know, subsequent to that would be to suggest strategies to help mitigate them. So that field, while... Um, it has grown. It's also evolving, uh, I, probably not to a mature standpoint, but I think it, it it will be getting there relatively soon. Yeah, I would add, I've kind of also seen it used for social sentiment. So looking across social media, seeing what the actual sentiment is, if there's, you know, changes, fluctuations there, that can actually help as uh, some of the signal and data coming in. I think one of my favorite stories based off of just social sentiment, is some folks started watching link linkedin and seeing when these big investment banks you know start um uh, having relationships with a variety of different companies to try to predict m a activity so there's lots of kind of interesting things you can get from actually taking advantage of all of the data that's out there i think we're also seeing some changes in the investment process overall because ai kind of lets you be more systematic in your sort of your information retrieval and processing workflow it means that of course there's tons of parts of the analyst process that we're not anywhere close to automating or using ai to do but we're we're gradually lifting the bar of what an analyst specifically should be doing so as ai is doing more of those tasks it actually creates more systemic knowledge for a, an asset manager or an investment fund or hedge fund, because now instead of one analyst has that information and the only way they can share it is through a report or through a meeting, right? Now it all becomes indexed and, and manageable and, and shared knowledge across the institution. So now the conversations between PMs and other PMs and PMs and analysts now are at a higher level because they're having a conversation about kind of the cumulative total of that systemic knowledge. So it's just making better investment decisions across the board. And in a sense that change, it, do, it reduces a certain type of risk, it opens up other types of risk, it, but it's ultimately, I think we're better off because we're getting more people seeing more points of information and that de-risks and decreases the number of blind spots you have. Nice, thank you. I, um, you know, kind of we talked about like risk, we talked about the algorithm trading, um, creating, you know, more efficiency in the market. But where do we see maybe that there would be limitations specifically for using artificial intelligence or document intelligence, you know, as um, as the co-pilot? But like where where do we think that that kind of flexes up to like what's the limit? So I can I can take that one as a starting point. Um, so I think what the potential limits are, are not understanding the limits, right? And, and particularly, we know that all AI models are wrong sometimes. So the question is, how are they going to be wrong? Can you predict how they're gonna be wrong? And can you create processes that systemically mitigate that particular risk? And I think when you lose sight of that and you start to rely on the technology too much with and just assuming it's infallible, that's where you start to open yourself up to some risks 
And that's where you want to really have a risk framework. You want to have a responsible AI framework in place so you can understand what are the places where it can get wrong and how are the ways that can correct that wrongness, right? And then therefore, in the end of the process, you might be able to get to a place where you're 100% right. But just coming right off the bat, you know, you might be at a certain percent. And how do you get through to that final percent and make sure there's safety? And honestly, a lot of times the best way to do that is by having a trusted, knowledgeable human in the loop, particularly with generative AI technologies that are coming out. But across the board, that's the case. Thanks, Charles. Kind of a, a follow up a little bit to that, you know, talking about the, you know, kind of the, the need mm -hmm. to, to limit the risks and to recognize the limits. Do we think that, you know, all of these new AI in the generative generative AI that's coming out, is it also contributing to market fairness? That's a really interesting question. When I think about it in fairness, it is, it is definitely sort of, you know, kind of bringing AI to everyone. Now the barrier of entry isn't so ridiculously high. When we first started doing document intelligence solutions, I don't know, about four and a half or five years ago, it was taking us engineer weeks in order to create one model. And that one model is so much like it's it's basically like comparing the the com, the compute on you know one of the 60s spaceships versus a cell phone today when you look at what chat gp gpt can actually do out of the box i showed some of the functionality embedded in a knowledge mining enterprise search cap capability which would take literally thousands and thousands of hours to to replicate and it's more or less available out of the box so we've really come a long way as far as that goes. Thanks, Steve. Um, does anybody else have anything to add? If not, I'll kind of shift gears a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think you don't you no longer have to be a large financial organization um, to have these kind of sophisticated models anymore, right? The uh, it's there's sort of like a democratization of of access to information that is taking place. And now the question is how fast is an organization willing to adopt um, these new innovations in order to compete, in order to lead, right? I, you know, and we easily see those customers of ours that are leading in, in their respective spaces versus those who aren't. And it's striking, right? Those, you know, obviously there always has to be um, a certain degree of security and risk mitigation factors, um, but that's essential to any organization, right? The question is how far an organization is willing to go in order to, um, you know, experiment and um, create, you know, uh, models that can bring success to their organizations, right? And can bring that level of innovation um, that could, you know, reach them to a higher level. Amazing. Thanks. So kind of like switching gears, this is, you know, more of almost more of a philosophical question with all of this coming, you know, very, very rapidly. And now with the democratization, it's, it's available to so many more organizations than it was before. Does anyone see a need for, you know, shifting regulatory, um, regulatories in, in capital markets. You know, I'm not going to necessarily dictate what regulators should and shouldn't do, but you know, I, I, I think that Rishi just mentioned the information advantage is shifting, mm -hmm. right? More from just like, instead of being kind of raw availability and raw techniques that used to be expensive, really it's about the process now. And I think there's going to be some interesting questions around fair use. I think there's going to be some interesting questions around what data is acceptable to use and what data is acceptable to scrape and collect. Um, I think that's somewhere where investment companies are going to have to definitely pay attention to what data they're collecting, what data they're storing, right? Um, if they're starting to kind of gather information about people in specific ways um, through like different telemetry that they can become available. I think that's where there's just going to be needs to be some caution around how that data is used and retained. 
And whether the regulations actually want to go and target those specific things, that's not for me to decide. But it is something that everybody should be kind of incorporating into the responsible AI is if we're capturing data that indirectly measures like individuals, right? Um, we need to be careful with how we use that, right? And do we just want to use aggregated data? And I mean, this is nothing new. I mean, investment companies have been thinking this way for a long time, but I just think that the problem has been exacerbated by how easy it is to gather and process and learn from this information. And that's really going to be the challenge I think that we're going to see is, is how do we do this in a safe way um, so we can inform investment decisions while respecting people's rights. Well said, Charles. Thank you. Um, so that's kind of, you know, uh, we can basically now just leave it with, I'd love if everybody could maybe share one piece of advice that they would give to, you know, capital markets companies that are already midstream AI with implementations or they're thinking about it, um, how they can make, make the most of, you know, all of this wonderful, you know, new generations of you know, knowledge and everything that are, that are coming to the forefront. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, obviously, and I, and a lot of others have stated it, right? Like we are, we are at the beginning stages of going through a renaissance right now, right? With, with what is being realized through artificial intelligence and the access to artificial intelligence is also like, you know, going back to being democratized, right? Like we have artificial intelligence now that could be used by common, you know, uh, business users, right, who don't have any knowledge of code, right? And that's that those those two those toolings are available in our Microsoft ecosystem, not to even mention the ecosystem that New Desic has through the document intelligence platform. Right. So um, you know, one thing I'd want to leave off is the fact that for those um for anyone who's like very fearful, um, there's obviously risk mitigation strategies in place. Microsoft has been planning for this for some time. You know, Charles has brought up responsible AI. We have been leaders in this field for quite some time, which is why one of the reasons why OpenAI developed this partnership with us, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and because of that, our partners like Nudesic are working with us on responsible AI. So um, because of that, you know, we're able to implement response, you know, a, you know, artificial intelligence models in a responsible way, right? That makes sense for, not only makes sense for our business, our stakeholders, our customers, um, but also helps to, you know, mitigate uh, risks and, and introduce safety, right? That's that's very paramount as well. So um, yeah, that's where I think I'd leave it at from my, my, my perspective. Thank you so much. Steve, I'll put you on the spot next. Yeah, I would add kind of like three main things. One is really use the right tool for the right job, right? We can solve some pretty interesting problems with AI, but you don't need to solve problems that can be solved by like business rules or something like that with AI. It just, you know, just make, just make sure that you're using the right tool for the right job. I would also say, make sure you have the right problem. Make sure that you're doing something that drives business value and you're going after using AI because it's going to help solve a problem and add value versus just because it's cool. And third, just really phone a friend. Microsoft is around, you know, we are around, we can help, you know, in the design session as well as the implementation. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of resources out there. Um, and I would just say leverage everything that is at your disposal. Thanks, Steve. And Charles. Yeah, I'm excited. So I have two things. One is a short thing and then there's a, a better one. So the first one is the first, everybody should just go turn on GitHub Copilot for their developers ASAP. And that sounds really salesy, but I promise it's not. It's the fastest way to get people in your organization benefiting from this technology in a way that they can see it immediately and immediately see results, both on the business side with 55% more developer productivity but also on the developer side with 76% higher developer happiness, right? So that's the first thing is you do that, you start to see the effects of this new wave of technology immediately. And all you did was flip a switch and, and then you, you get to, get to go. Um, the second piece is what I say is the competitive advantages and moats have changed completely, right? So that we talked about that information advantage is not the same information advantage it was. The data advantage is not the same data advantage it was. It has shifted. And finally, scale 
is not the same advantage that it used to be because we have all customers at all scales, whether it's a more nimble hedge fund or one of the, you know, some of the larger asset managers, we have customers in all of those cross sections who are not asking if they should use this technology. They're saying, how do we prioritize where we use this technology and do it safely? And those are the ones that are going to move really fast. And that's going to develop the competitive advantage for the next decade. So that's what I would encourage people is if you're not thinking that way, reframe your thinking and, and think that way because it's things are going to move very quickly as they've already been. I can't even keep up with it right now. Right. And this is what I do every day for a living. The changes are going to keep coming and are going to keep coming faster. Nice. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today and to everybody watching uh, wherever you may be in the world. Thank you for, for joining us as well. And we wish you, wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Bye.